There were a series of breakout sessions and conversations that were happening earlier today, and these gentlemen here on stage with me were the moderators of these conversations. So just to try to get you up to speed, as we talked about civility earlier in the day, um, how did each of your groups kind of really tackle this topic, or what was the kind of key theme? If you could try to summarize it in just a minute or two, let's start with you. Thank you, Hari, and uh, welcome everyone to the National Constitution Center. Wow, round one. <laughs> They were civil to each they other. They were, they were very. Um, oh, maybe they'll switch positions next time they walk by too. My group uh, focused on social innovation. We were really the non-academic uh, group, and what we were trying to focus on was the relationship between civility and uh, actually solving key social problems or our social effectiveness. And what we determined was uh, we, asked, we approached the question many different ways, namely, how important is civility in terms of being effective at solving our challenges? And together we agreed that civility is highly important. And we agreed that without uh, civil conversation, those of us that focus on solving challenges really can't do our work, whether it's around healthcare or education or immigration. Um, we spent a good deal of time focusing specifically on the healthcare uh, debate in this country and came to the recognition that there are many different ways that incivility has made it really hard to drive compromise. I think the one thing that the group decided was that uh, civility required something that effectiveness also requires, which is the, the willingness to be in a meaningful conversation, the willingness to listen to each other, and the existence of a venue that's a safe place to have that conversation. Our group was on ethics and public philosophy, and we uh, did have uh, political philosophers in the group, but also uh, uh, members of the media, activist organizations, uh, law professor, and uh, amongst this group, uh, there was a strong sense that robust political discourse is desirable so that uh, there wasn't an interest in uh, focusing on promoting a relatively narrow understanding of civility as simply habits of polite and courteous conversation. Uh, but there was a belief that uh, participants in uh, political discourse uh, would benefit uh, from showing uh, greater concern uh, to uh, uh, make arguments uh, that are truthful, uh, greater respect for opponents, including uh, uh, really trying to grasp the opponent's arguments and not react to it uh, uh, disproportionately. And there was a sense that these kinds of uh, responsibilities are greater uh, for governing officials, for uh, political leaders. They should be uh, more uh, conscious of trying to be truthful and respectful uh, uh, responsibilities of the general public are um, real but uh, lesser. Beyond that, we discussed, um, because many felt civility is not the key problem, uh, a number of other uh, possible uh, changes in American life, um, uh, including uh, improving education to promote grasping of other points of view. Uh, some suggested modifications of electoral institutions, of campaign uh, funding, um, and everyone was uh, concerned about the role of the media in reinforcing um, uh, polarization. But there wasn't agreement on uh, solutions in this regard, um, except perhaps that uh, the media uh, cannot easily uh, should not be regulated. Uh, uh, reform from within uh, is all we can um, uh, hope for. Uh, some thought that our problems are not so severe. Uh, some thought that they are uh, profoundly uh, severe. And on those topics, we had a good discussion, but not agreement. I was uh, a part of the religion group, and uh, we had a diverse group of people who were both uh, uh, pastors as well as teachers of religion. and, and 
uh, people in public media, uh, we asked ourselves what are the distinctive contributions that religion makes both to complicate and to uh, uh, complexify the, the question about civility here. So uh, one of the strands that we lingered on a bit was the prophetic tradition within uh, religious communities uh, to be at times deeply incivil in the name of truth or in the name of God. And we explored that to, to some degree, uh, the boundaries of civility and, and um, uh, uh, unrest and, and uh, even rebellion at times. Um, we also lingered on a question about uh, the problem of learning to talk about our deepest differences when our deepest differences are frequently uh, the result or tied up with our religious beliefs. And uh, we found that that was a, a big problem, but also an opportunity to learn how to talk to one another in a particular way. Uh, and in order to do that, our group uh, spent some time discussing teaching about religion, uh, both through uh, avenues of public education uh, in schools, but also through the media. So we considered teaching uh, classes about religion, uh, and the perils of doing that and the, uh, the potential upside of doing that, um, and also about uh, questions of whether or not exposing people to diversity uh, was a threat to religious belief, a boon to religious belief, or a boon to civility and the kind of conversations we might have. All of that was uh, part of the question about informing our conversation about the things that matter to us most so that we can be uh, respectful of each other as human beings, even if we weren't uh, uh, admiring of religious beliefs that, uh, that we disagreed with. Uh, I uh, moderated the communications and media group, and like all the other groups, it was a very uh, diverse collection of people, and so it was very difficult to come up with any kind of specific agreement about recommendations for how we could improve the media. Um, I, I do have bad news for our moderator. There was some support for defunding public media in our group. Um, but beyond that, I think uh, um, the things we talked about was how the media could uh, encourage uh, uh, more responsible speech by uh, celebrating critiques of irresponsible speech within ideological camps. Um, uh, because if you critique somebody from another political view for their uh, rhetorical behavior, uh, that's just seen as a political attack. Um, there, we lamented uh, the decline of, uh, of, of fact-based investigative reporting and the, and the trends toward more punditry and commentary. Uh, part of that is a, a, a function of, of um, another issue we addressed, and that is the profit model of, uh, uh, of the way the media is structured in this country. And so we did toss around the idea that there could be other models of journalism uh, with uh, uh, nonprofit models of journalism and so on, but we didn't get real specific about what those might look like. Um, we uh, also talked about audience and how we could encourage um, all citizens to expose themselves to a variety of of different kinds of media and diverse voices uh, and to be more critical uh, consumers of media content. And finally, uh, we discussed it at some length uh, uh, how the media might uh, model cross-ideological discussions uh, rather than reinforcing the kind of echo chamber that people complain about uh, nowadays as, uh, as contributing to the polarization of the, uh, of the public. Uh, my group was uh, 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 discussing the, the, the simple but very big topic of history, uh, the history of political debate and decision making and the relationship of issues of civility and democracy uh, to that. It was a, a terrific group of uh, 11 people. Our discussion uh, reminded me a bit of a very long and lively dinner party with lots of wine flowing. <laughs> Uh, really and it made for a ever? lively discussion, but it makes it difficult to summarize our, our conclusions succinctly. Um, I, I, I would say this, uh, that uh, uh, the evidence to all of us suggests that um, outbursts of incivility uh, have been around almost since the very beginning. Uh, since the advent of democratic politics in America in the 1790s, uh, uh, we've seen these outbursts of incivility. Uh, but there was also, so in, in one sense we concluded, well, there's nothing really new under the sun. Uh, but in another sense, I think that we all had, many of us anyway, had this feeling that the level of vituperation that we see in our political discourse today is very much out of proportion to the magnitude and importance and gravity of the issues 
uh, on which these discussions are held. We all agree, by the way, that the one period of American history uh, which was an exception to this generalization was the Civil War, where there was both incivility and obviously some really very great and important issues uh, involved. So that's a, a sort of general feeling uh, that the group had. Um, I think as a group we were as much concerned with the functionality or dysfunctionality of politics as we were with the issue of civility. I think we all, looking at the history of American politics, uh, are able to tolerate some level of incivility as long as the government is able to get something done. Uh, and again, I think most, perhaps not all of us, uh, were inclined respectfully, I think, to, to perhaps disagree uh, with Congressman Hamilton's comment this morning, uh, that, that we do see a, a disturbing element of dysfunctionality, uh, uh, particularly in our nation's uh, Congress uh, today. Um, we tried to get at the causes of this increase in, in civility and dysfunctionality. Uh, I'm afraid the media came in for some uh, pretty hard knocks on, on that score. Uh, and I'm, I'm somewhat sad to report that we didn't have any magical solutions. I think there was a sense that the genie is out of the bottle uh, and we're not sure how to, how to put him or her back in that bottle. Okay, so well, one of the things, uh, a, a kind of a common thread that I uh, heard when I watched a few of these online and just visited your rooms was that there's perhaps a false bifurcation, that this is a left-right or liberal conservative issue, that this is the, the Tea Party on one end or the Republicans over here or the, or, you know. So what did your groups think about that? Is there um, some need to try to figure out how to represent the spectrum of political thought and where people fit on that continuum a little bit better? Maybe it's not just the media's job, but also these organizations? Well, I, we did address it in the sense that, you know, I think we acknowledge there's uh, uh, irresponsibility uh, on both sides of the political spectrum, and that's what we are trying to come up with, is how do we uh, discourage that? And, uh, and I think the suggestion, and I believe it was uh, Kathleen Jameson that made the suggestion that, that, one, that the most impactful ways to do that is to have people within the, their own ideological camps. Um, we must persuade them uh, to draw the line when, when their colleagues are uh, being rhetorically irresponsible. And if I can add, there was a uh, perception that the changes in the American political system and the media over time have both contributed to a situation in which uh, uh, partisan political elites in both parties are more polarized, less willing to be um, uh, respectful, not uh, merely willing to compromise uh, than at most, certainly not all points in um, America's past contributing uh, to dysfunctionality, and uh, that one uh, source of that was that uh, uh, campaigns are now uh, perpetual uh, and the media pick up on the most sensationalistic uh, aspects that help mobilize um, uh, voters and activists, and uh, this contributes to the polarization that gets in the way of governing. I think we had a big discussion about this in our religion group, of course, as well, uh, to recognize the fact that there are no uh, two positions on any given uh, idea. Uh, and so for us, the, the, the model was to uh, help educate people and to remind ourselves and others that, that there are no two positions. Islam is not either a violent religion or a peaceful religion. Uh, uh, evangelicals are not simply either progressives or conservatives politically. There, there, there's a wide space and millions of opportunities uh, to uh, talk to your neighbor, to read about uh, other religious traditions and find the many spaces and not to try to bifurcate uh, debate or polarize debate uh, on an issue that's so complicated as religion. There's so many options. We had some disagreement. There was, there was a little uh, sense among uh, some in the group that uh, actually Republicans might uh, benefit more from, uh, from incivility, which um, I think others in the group strongly uh, disagreed with I, and felt that it went, ra felt it went both ways. Um, but I also think that um, there was generally an implicit sense among our group that there really is sort of two sides, that this is not that this incivility is not sort of networked incivility, that it really is sort of right versus left uh, in terms of how it's playing out in policy. 
I mean, is you know something that uh, you touched on in the sort of history group? Does incivility increase our distrust in government, or does government increase the? You know, it's a sort of where's that loop? Where's that feedback loop here? Is that that because the government is dysfunctional, is that why we're becoming more incivil, or does it actually decrease the effectiveness of government when we are incivil? Toward uh, the end of our discussion, uh, Ken Burns uh, quoting quoted George Washington, who described uh, government as the the palladium of liberty and the palladium of security. But yet, for so many Americans today. Government is the enemy. It's the opposite uh, of that, uh, and 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 that fundamental divide, that fundamental distrust uh, of of government, did seem to many of us to be driving uh, some of the passion in uh, today's political debate. I'll confess that that many of us, and another one of our panelists, Dan Okren, chided us a little bit. This group did have a liberal bias, I must say. <laughs> and, and so he, he really chided us into putting ourselves in the shoes and heads of Republicans or Tea Partiers uh, to, to um, uh, imagine their view uh, of the world, to sympathize a bit uh, more with their view. Again, we, we agree that in the present uh, uh, age of media, it's getting harder and harder to do that. I mean, it, it seems that there is a certain effectiveness to being incivil, right? I mean, we, we all watched what happened in Wisconsin because people decided to uh, protest their government in certain ways. Now, if it was absolutely peaceful and if it sort of didn't, um, if, if there weren't people shouting necessarily, would the cameras be there, right? That's, that's one of the questions that you always get. I could write letters to congressmen very quietly. I could organize a, a campaign of letter writers. That's never going to make the evening news. So is there a certain effectiveness? I mean, is being in civil one of the best ways to try to get your uh, point across? Well, that certainly speaks to the media group again, because it is, is, the, is the way to get attention on the media. That's clear. Um, and, you know, some people argue, Susan Herbst has a new book called Rude Democracy, in which she argues both civility and incivility are strategic choices. Um, sometimes people use uh, the appeal to civility to silence uh, the voices of dissent, and, some, and people who are dissenters use incivility to attract attention and, and, uh, and uh, uh, be heard. So both of them are strategic choices, certainly, and in the context of the media, incivility is very effective. Now, uh, what I think uh, Congressman Hamilton was trying to say today is that it's not uh, an effective strategy in the context of, uh, of a congressional debate or a policymaking process in general. And there's some disagreement, I guess, with that position among some of our panelists. Well, I, I was going to add, just in, in 1787, the framers of the Constitution met for four months, just four months, and got a heck of a lot done. Uh, completely away from the glare uh, of the media, uh, and, and that uh, and, and that luxury that they had, uh, plus the leadership um, models that men like Washington and Franklin provided for them, actually subtly enforced a kind of civility uh, that enabled people to get something done. So I, I, I think I disagree that, that incivility is, is always the best way of getting something done. I also think it's worth discussing. Our, our group was r really s split on whether you would call Wisconsin uh, uncivil. We had, you know, tens, maybe 100,000 people uh, protesting, uh, being uh, collective bargaining, being taken out. On the one hand, you could say, well, given the, the really low number of incidents, um, that was actually remarkably civil. Or, uh, as Kelly did this morning, you could point to some of the language and some of the imagery, for example, chalk outlines of the, the governor's body on the ground as uh, signaling a high level of incivility. On the other hand, you know, when you have potentially a rowdy mob uh, like that, having it not, in fact, become a mob, um, but, but stay folks that are really sitting in to make a point, uh, maybe that is fundamentally civil. I, I also want to note on this sunshine question, our group uh, really felt that there is a real importance to pr the ability for people to have private conversations. It creates a challenge, some in our group felt, 
when you have moneyed interest potentially in inside the closed door without sunlight. Uh, but nevertheless, in general, there has to be an ability to have that private conversation among leaders in order to begin to actually hear each other. Now, whether that conversation is possible in the era of WikiLeaks is another story, but. Yeah, on the question of incivility, I'd say that uh, our discussion uh, provided a number of examples where uh, incivility is effective uh, in campaigning, it's effective in agenda setting, and some participants um, argued that it was often appropriate under circumstances where you were challenging uh, protectors of uh, real and severe injustices. Uh, and that was one reason uh, why, uh, although um, uh, constant ex um, excessive incivility in the halls of government, yes, that can be a problem, the general perception was uh, that's not the biggest problem that we should be focusing on. And speaking of those bigger problems, I mean, are we essentially, uh, you know, rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic here, talking about being polite when there are such gross inequities, the, the, the causes for frustration are so deep that people are so impassioned by it, whether it is that they can't find a job or whether it is that, I mean, so, you know, how much does, I guess maybe we define civility here, and it, is this something beyond our hospitable nature to one another and how we speak? At the very end of uh, uh, my group's uh, discussion, uh, Alan Brinkley, raise the issue of growing inequality in America, not just uh, the, the fear and unease produced by this particular recession, which we're still living through, but the, the, the gradual increase, actually the dramatic increase uh, from the, the, the 1980s forward of income inequality uh, as a generator of fear uh, and insecurity. Uh, and so in, in, in that respect, I think some of us, not all of us, uh, felt that, that, that the kind of passion uh, that, we, uh, what, that we hear and see in politics um, is, is, is just a symptom. Uh, and it's a symptom of, of uh, a deeper fear and insecurity that Americans haven't felt for many generations. Our group had a, had a challenge in our invitations. We invited people that were running <coughs> organizations trying to fix problems. And we had, uh, I think unlike the other groups, this challenge where people would basically say, look, we're not interested in talking about talking. We're trying to get things done. Um, and in our group, we realized that's actually a problem because in order for us to deal with income inequality, in order to deal with issues like education, immigration, some of these underlying problems, uh, we actually need to be able to have productive conversations. So what are, the, what are the responsibilities here that we as citizens have versus, say, for example, the people who we elect have? Um, I think in, uh, early on in your history conversation, I remember you being so disappointed that, that, that Washington and Franklin would not allow uh, incivility in those conversations. But today, um, the leadership almost seems to prey on it. Um, and earlier this morning, uh, Lee Hamilton was talking about how the minority leader pointed out an error to him uh, even though he disagreed with the legislation, but he wanted to get things done right. Uh, and, and that kind of, that kind of uh, congeniality doesn't exist today. So what do, we, what do we say when we go to the polls? But hey, listen, I'll vote for you, but you gotta be nice. Well, in our group, we, we, we spoke about uh, hospitality as being uh, a religious uh, principle uh, for many people that could help uh, bridge this sort of uh, divide at the at the citizen level, not the not at the uh, elected official level, but perhaps as well that religious communities have principles of hospitality and mutual respect that they should draw upon at least uh, to help us with this problem of incivility. Okay. Our, our group was fortunate enough to include uh, Mayor Wilson Good, and uh, he cited a, a point at which two weeks before every election. He found that he'd be in the, the subway and train stations shaking people's hands. And about two weeks before every election, they would opt uh, not to shake his hand. People would walk by without really looking at him when they decided. And I was expecting him to say, and that is you know, where incivility begins to go into politics. And, he, and he, he went the exact opposite way. He said, and that's something that you have to be able to respect. They had made the decision that they're not going to support me because they don't like what, I was, what I'm doing. Uh, they make that decision about two weeks before the election. And that's completely within their, their right and not in uncivil. 
Okay, so we've got kind of an interesting uh, format for this. You saw the uh, our, our our young mascots walk by. That was that was round <laughs> one. I'll just call them that uh, versus the thing that I'm thinking about calling them. But uh, uh, they'll they'll walk by again and they'll signal round two, and that's for the participants. All the participants that were assembled here are going to have an opportunity. It's uh, it's sort of a very um, a very cerebral version of Survivor. You're, you're going to be able to kick people off the island. Vote us off the island. Right. So there you go. There's round two. So uh, if you could go ahead and if you can go ahead and uh, start to line up, and really the, the way that the conversation is going to flow, remember that uh, you know we'll kind of continue this conversation. If you have some thoughts and ideas that you want to say, listen, we also talked about this in our group, and this is really important to me, then come up here, and then eventually, as you spend too much time up here, you'll get booted off by the next person. So um, while we do that, while you're, while you're lining up here, let me also just say uh, kind of one other question for your groups. That's right. Now would be the time. Get up, really. <laughs> And we're, yeah, we're also going to have some audience response questions. You've got some little boxes that are with you, and I'll, I'll get some cards going uh, in a bit here. Um, so the, the last question for these five moderators that I wanted was that um, how, do we, how do we, what do we do with the, with the body politic, with the public that's out there? Um, how do we increase a level of civic literacy? And um, is it the school systems? Is it the churches? Is it... Uh, the workplaces that we need to figure out ways that really emphasize the importance of listening to an alternative viewpoint? Is it just the media's responsibility? Well, we were uh, fortunate uh, to have a uh, high school teacher in our group who described to us uh, the um, uh, experience of uh, exercises that um, uh, expose his students uh, to uh, hearing and engaging arguments from other sides, uh, including uh, observing uh, opposing arguments in uh, the courts of law. Uh, but we also agreed that uh, the education system in general uh, doesn't foster those experiences as much as it um, uh, might. And uh, uh, some years ago, I was on a committee uh, that examined the social studies books that were uh, used in our local public schools, the commercially available ones, and they tended to, like polite dinner guests, stay away from topics of politics and religion because they would be too controversial, but that does not provide an education uh, where you're used to uh, engaging uh, and understanding opposing points of view uh, on controversial issues. So that uh, is an area where we could do better. We yeah. had a couple of terrific uh, teachers in the, the history group, uh, plus a, a, a couple of other individuals who've really spent their careers working in the, in the field of, of education. Uh, and, and I think there was a sense uh, that the civics education narrowly defined, which means sort of opening people's heads up and pouring information <laughs> about the articles of the Constitution, uh, it, it's not what's uh, required or, or, or needed. That what really is needed is the kind of education that involves experience and engagement. Uh, those are buzzwords, civic engagement, uh, but, uh, uh, but, but they were able to describe real instances in, in, in which students, when they looked back on their education and what really meant something to them, they described experiences. They didn't uh, uh, describe memorizing uh, the content of Article Two of the Constitution. Yeah, I agree. And I just want to add. I think, in answer to your question, it's all of the above. I mean, the, you know, the me. We need political reform. We need media reform, and so on. But I would like to, to echo the point about uh, civic education. Civic education is. Number one, not been, been very fashionable in recent years, and number two, it has been focused very much on how a bill becomes a law and, and very traditional mainstream kinds of political issues. And uh, I know Michael Shudson in our group talked about how for young people, uh, there's a lot of different ways to become engaged politically, and they define politics differently than perhaps uh, some, of I, some of us do. And I, and I would endorse, you know, again, what you're saying, and, and I, uh, the National Constitution Center's done some great programs, I think, educating young people about how to deliberate. The process of being an engaged citizen means discussing tough issues with their fellow citizens. And, uh, and that's something that has kind of disappeared from the schools, mostly because of parents. The kids want it. 
but the parents don't think their kids ought to be discussing controversial issues in the school. And, and that's, that's not good. That, that, that is one, not preparing them for citizenship. One of the programs that we have that, the, um, that teachers and parents like the most is actually a play where we take some of the hottest issues, gun control, um, immigration uh, issues, um, uh, privacy in schools, and actually uh, have actors play out the adversaries in those. And those discussions are often highly emotionally charged. Uh, you could potentially say uh, not civil. And yet the student's ability to see those uh, people facing each other and arguing their, those points of passion really changes for the students their outlook on what, on what uh, political discourse really means. Well, there's nothing more controversial than talking about religion in public schools, and that was a, a core feature of our, of our conversation. But most of our group, at least, with, with a, one or two exceptions, really wanted to drive headlong into the, the, the question, and for two different reasons. One, if civic education is uh, broadly uh, uh, involves both knowledge, particular knowledge, skills of uh, dialogue and conversation, and also dispositions, uh, commitments to the common good and certain virtues. Teaching about religion in public schools can do all of those things in a very particular way. Teachers can model a certain kind of conversation in the classroom that students need to to, to talk about the things that matter to them most, even if they're not the religious questions, when they go out into broader society. So we felt like religion had a lot to offer, uh, both in challenges and promises on that question. Okay, uh, and you all have these tiny little remote control type switches in your hands, so the first question I have here, that's right, there's some audience participation involved, wake up. Um, We're I know. waiting to be tagged up here. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. These guys, the these guys are <laughs> panelists liberate me from the island. Right. Unless, unless you think truly that these are the best representatives that you could ever have for your opinions. That's what you're telling the internet audience, right? Uh, Wilson? So, Wilson, David, Lauren? <laughs> he's going to start embarrassing people. Shaming is always a good tactic. Uh, the f first question is agree or disagree? I mainly watch news outlets that share my political views. Press one for agree. Press two for disagree. Again, that's one for agree and two for disagree with the sentence, I mainly watch news outlets that share my political views. And we're going to be asking uh, the folks that are streaming online as well, and I'll, I'll give you the answer when it's fed into my ear. Um, so uh, we, have, we have one brave individual. Really? That's it? That's what you can muster up? OK. Um, that we've got another one coming up. So yes, uh, so let's jump in. Hi, my name is Carl Ackerman, and I'm a public teacher here in the Philadelphia School District. And one of the things that I've seen as a public teacher is that the high schools should be the places where democracy happens. Mm -hmm. And thank goodness we have a place like the National Constitution Center where we can come and have these conversations. But those conversations are not happening in our local high schools in the city of Philadelphia. Uh, we uh, Elections, polling stations are held on days when we have professional development so that there's not this interference between the students coming into class and people going to vote. We also have a situation where we Schools are the places for students to go to learn information, but there's not, they're not a place for democracy to happen outside of school. Uh, parents should be coming into schools. Uh, local uh, government officials should be coming into schools after the school days ended and really having town hall meetings within the high school. This happens in small towns, but it doesn't necessarily happen in a big urban district at all the high schools. And where we see students actually getting involved in civic participation happens when something happens at their school where they don't feel they have any control, and then they have to protest. And we've been having this happen in Philadelphia. And this is uh, the students actively engaging in uh, civic participation by doing protests, which I would, I liked when the panel said that protest doesn't have to be seen as something in civil. Okay. Just say your name and where you're from. So um, I'm Lauren Schwartz, and I'm from uh, St. Louis. I work at the Nine Network of Public Media, and I was on uh, David's panel about social innovation. Okay. So are you here to defund public media and yourself? <laughs> I, I hope no. not. <laughs> What was the, what, what, what made you want to come up here? What was the thing that? Um, I think the discussion about education, something we talked about during our panel was um, the need for media literacy in schools and for kids to really understand 
um, what it means to have bias, to have a balance of opinions, but also the need for um, many voices to be heard. So not just you know point and counterpoint, but to really bring light to um, all the opinions that are in between. Because I think oftentimes um, when there's something that's really polarized and a really um, polarizing issue, you can get you know to one side or the other side or you can completely tune it out because you're frustrated. So I think if we can bring those voices back up, that's when we can really start to have some dialogue. Okay, so uh, we have some results in already from this audience. It's almost evenly split. 53% say you agree that I mainly watch news outlets that share my political views. 47% say you disagree. But online, it's a little different. Uh, let me get the number again. I think is it 75 75% online agree that they mainly watch news outlets that share their political views and 25% disagree. It's kind of interesting. Um, and also get a second question in here since we're talking a little bit about the media and literacy. Uh, so this is a yes or no question. Take out your wands. Uh, the question is, does the media have a responsibility to keep the national discussion civic? One is yes, two is no. All right? Civil. civil. So, I'm sorry, civil. What am I here for today? <laughs> I think I've heard the word civility more times in one day than uh, in the last like five years. And that's not because I'm in the media, I'm just saying. So again, just in case, does the media have a responsibility to keep the national discussion civil? Uh, one is a yes and two is a no. So um, in, in that thread, I think what, what's interesting is how people decide to say, well, you know, uh, I, get, I get phone calls from television networks. This was a, a, com uh, a comment that I think Lee Hamilton made this morning and, and others people have echoed in, in different places too that say, you're pre-screening me. I really have to be extreme for you to take me seriously. Um, so how do you make, let's, perhaps this is a media education and teachable moment for me or anybody else that's listening or watching. How do you make the middle and the gray and the nuanced interesting and compelling to consume? I think it's really by showing that that's the voice that needs to be heard. I mean, it's kind of, I think it's a little unfortunate that the only voices being heard are the ones that are the loudest. Um, and I think the middle does need to kind of step up and say, you know, these issues matter. Um, when we're talking about healthcare, I think sometimes people don't become involved in the debate because they don't understand it enough. They don't feel like they have a voice in it. But if we can provide information and help people better understand how it actually does directly affect them, then they might actually see the need to get involved and actually share their voice. I, I would love to hear uh, that question answered by some of our media folks. I think a lot of us spend a lot of our time trying so I know in trying to get the National Constitution Center heard on some of these issues, it requires um, being clever, say with a title that says, can we talk? Um, but actually a more clever thing to do would be to uh, um, be more provocative, but as you get more provocative, uh, you get less civil. I'd be really interested, for example, what Ken Burns would, uh, how he would answer the question about but he's got to get in line and get down on here to get, get on stage first, you know what I'm saying? Like, look at these three brave individuals. If she was in his group, shouldn't she be over there? <laughs> yeah, she hijacked. Uh, well, uh, staff gave her uh, someone else to hijack. So okay. I'm, I'm actually here inappropriately. All right. So anybody can replace me. That's right. So we've got, uh, we've got the results in from question two. Again, the, the question that we asked was, does the media have a responsibility to keep the national discussion civic? Civil. It just looks like a C, really. Um, uh, and here in the room, two-thirds of you, 66%, for those of you who really need the numbers that way, said yes, it is the media's responsibility. Online, interestingly enough, 83% said yes. So when you, kind of, when you think about the fact that 75% of the online audience that was polled and responded, obviously not a scientific survey, all those disclaimers included, they said that they are listening to media that is similar to what they agree with. But at the same time, they feel it's the media's responsibility to keep the national discussion civil, 83% of them. All right, it's kind of interesting. So if you guys want to keep lining up, uh, you're welcome to. All right, so um, can, go ahead. Can I just yeah. comment? Uh, that's an interesting finding because, of course, the, uh, the media's uh, response to criticism of, of them featuring the, the loudest voices and the more extreme voices is they are just giving the people what they want. So that's an interesting response in that, that context. If I can also add to that, I think um, the fear in not 
being a loud voice or her being really opinionated is that people won't listen. But mm -hmm. I think there's a way to have perspective without being loud or, or demeaning someone else's point of view. So I think as long as you can have perspective, um, you can still showcase you know, balance and many sides. You just don't have to be the one yelling and saying, well, the other side's completely wrong. Well, Go ahead. As, as the new kid on the block. The same um, name and where you're from? Uh, my name is Munir Crady. I am a, a teacher in the Philadelphia School District and an actor, and I would consider myself a traveler as well. Um, regarding the media, it's always interesting to see how the news media in this country is kind of shown as tonight's news, CBS, CNN, whatever, with so-and-so as the anchor person, and they sort of glamorize the anchor person. The, the, the person who produces the news is the news when in most foreign news uh, programs, they kind of look at them as the news reader. Mm -hmm. And they just bring the news. They don't throw opinion in it. They don't throw uh, various other aspects that, that make these news programs look so slanted as they do here. So are they giving the news or are they making the news themselves? Well, I, I don't think I ever have uh, to run that risk at the news hour because nobody's really going to be able to spell my name out. So <laughs> it's, uh, or even pronounce it correctly. So that's, that's not going to be it. Okay. So, um, well, hey, sorry, did you have something to add? I just wanted to say that I think there's a point where we have to be very careful where civility can also be interpreted as censorship because who determines what is civil and that people who are oppressed who feel that they have no power in a situation, maybe shouting is the only way they can be heard. And if we try to say, well, that's not the expectation of behavior, that's not being civil, it's a way of also censoring their, their voice. By the determination of what is and what isn't civil. Thanks for joining us. Tell us who you are and why you're up here. Okay, uh, Michael Shutson, I teach at the Columbia Journalism School. Uh, I figured probably someone needed to defend someone the media. Needs, please, right. I can't, I'm the moderator. Right, okay. Um, I was thinking as I was sitting in, in the audience and not coming up here, what would get me to come up here? Um, and uh, what finally did was, was, was a sense of obligation uh, to the, the uh, moderator of our, our breakout session. Uh, but the other thing that would have gotten me up here was uh, strong, very strong agreement or even better disagreement with something that had already been said. And as, as I reflected on my own subjective feelings there, I thought, hmm, I mean, that's probably something that, mod that, that drives the media. Um, you want something clear, you want something forceful, and you want something that's going to make people get up on stage. Um, and I, I don't you know, in, in terms of our, our general considerations here, I don't see how we're going to change that. Um, I, I think that's natural and normal, and uh, you want an audience, you want to generate a response, and sometimes that the, the relatively uncivil um, uh, statement is what's going to do that. The relatively extreme statement is what's going to do that, and that helps you know, within bounds, which would need to be defined, but that helps make conversation work. You know, this this is kind of interesting because, uh, and and our our newest guest up here can help answer this as well. But thanks to Twitter, we we are all of us getting far more used to the soundbite. We're getting used to 140 characters as a, an completely all-encompassing thought, right? We retweet or forward on and amplify a message very quickly in near real time. There was a, uh, um, a gentleman this morning that, was, uh, that had a comment, I think, in the, that said that um, one of our founding fathers had gone to Italy and called another founding father's mother a whore. Okay, but it took a while for that news to reach back to the United States. And perhaps the, the, those, those, the time for passions to cool is impossible today and that if someone calls you out on Twitter or Facebook or all of a sudden you have your aunt ringing you saying, oh my God, did you hear what this politician or what this news person or whatever it is that had to say about you, 
is, is the technology forcing a greater amount of incivility? Is that a question to me? Yes. Okay. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> say who you are. I'm sorry. I'm John Palfrey from the Harvard Law School, and I was just responding to shame. That's the only reason I'm Thank up you. here. And Thank you. Trying to <laughs> save David and others. Um, but no, there was this moment, right, where you think um, democracy, use it or lose it, all these things we've been talking about all day, and um, you kind of have to get up out of your chair, chair. But I had nothing to say, so I'm glad you had a question for me. Um, <laughs> Look at that guy. He was transparent about the whole thing. You've got to right. give it to that's him for that. True. So, uh, how is it changing? I think the internet does several things, but I do think we should start by saying that these new technologies are not the technologies driving it. It's us driving it. We are the designers of the technology. We're the users. The agency is on our part. But what does our use of social media do to our discourse? It does a bunch of things. One, it speeds things up. Plainly, it's a faster cycle between different people saying different things. Plainly, there are more people who can say more things. Um, plainly, there's a scale effect. Anyone who writes something from this room here at Constitution CT instead of National Constitution Center, you know, could be hear, heard anywhere else in the world that someone has uh, access to the technology. As you noted, there's a premium on fast and short and so forth. And I think the last thing that it does primarily is it's an amplifier. So if something is intriguing, it gets uh, made viral, right, by this retweeting uh, effect that you described. And I do think that that is something that can skew us in terms of the, um, the more provocative and the more soundbitey is more likely to go viral in that sense. Okay, I'm going to uh, take some moderator privilege here, and we're going to change the rules of round two. Each one of these people can shame you, one of you publicly to get you on the chair. I think it's totally fair. So pick somebody in your group that you really disagreed with, perhaps, to get them on this chair. So one way or another, you're going to have to come up here. Let's just, let's just do that. So, because if shame works, then so be it. Uh, I'd like to add something about, you know, the news, the news business in itself is a business. You're based on ratings. If you come up with something, you know, loud enough, different enough, uh, shocking enough, you're going to get people to watch. And people like to watch this. So therefore, that's, that's what we get, the stories we get. Hold on. I think, you know what, you might not be off the hook that fast. I think there was some sort of a rhyme or reason. So the person that's on there longest is the, word, the one that gets booted. Is that right? No, no, you, just you I think, uh, yes, that's you. You're out. You're, you're back in. You're back in. <laughs> yeah. Really, see that? Yeah, exactly. That's what you get for being a volunteer. No good deed goes unpunished. Thank you very That'll much for staying. Show them all. That's everybody's going to no, stay. No, no, no. I think that. Yeah, exactly. So literally, make eye contact with one person and really just guilt them, and this will work. Okay. So I'm sorry, uh, sir. Uh, introduce yourself. Yes, William Allen. I'm from Michigan State University, and I came down as a sacrificial victim Thank for you. my colleagues who I didn't want to see shamed. <laughs> But I will say something on the question that has been mooted in the last few moments. Uh, I'll remind you of the story of Balaam's ass, if I may. Uh, Balaam uh, was, of course, a prophet who was resisting direction from God and going on his way to respond to an invitation from Balak to curse the is, people of Israel. His ass prevented his moving, and he abused the ass in a most uncivil way. But the ass spoke. And this outrageous, unseen thing of the ass speaking got his attention such that once he opened his ears, he was able to open his eyes and see the angel blocking the way. Hmm. Sometimes what you call uncivil speech is needed to open people's eyes. So for, you can feel free to clap. You're fine. Um, you know, it, it's in several conversations about the civil rights movement, we kind of hear that would Malcolm, uh, I mean, would, would Martin Luther King Jr. have been as effective had there not been the force of a Malcolm X? Um, and in, in, I guess, in, in closer terms today, um, are there advantages or disadvantages for the conservative movement if uh, elements of the Tea Party represent a very strong force in one direction or the other? I mean, we've already seen just in the past few weeks that um, Speaker Boehner has had um, has made certain decisions that he might not have had he not had a very strong base of Tea Party supporters, or I should say, Tea Party uh, advocates that were members that decided to say, "Okay, this is really important to us." That might not exactly be where the the party's going. Certainly, I'll, I'll speak to it as someone who's been a victim of uncivil speech for more than two decades. I I'm restive with the predicate that the subject of discussion is the Tea Party. Mm. It strikes me that that's an inappropriate way to frame the discussion of incivility. 
the real question is, what is the common discourse and where do we all stand in it? And rather than naming one part of that discourse, I think we ought to ask ourselves, what is our responsibility to the discourse? So that to take the Tea Party as a totem of incivility, which is the unspoken premise, is I think is fundamentally mistaken. Okay, there. Ma'am, you came up because, don't you stay shame. <laughs> I think I came, um, my name is Tanya Hamilton and I'm a filmmaker and um, I think I came up just because I, I wanted to also maybe interject a little bit uh, of kind of the ordinary person into the conversation um, and to maybe kind of, uh, I was on the media panel and um, maybe to kind of talk a little bit about, um, maybe take it a little bit beyond sort of the idea of sort of news, uh, be it sort of uh, television or radio or uh, print and maybe you look at sort of uh, narrative media and how that affects the ordinary person um, and how that sort of shapes in a way our ideas of sort of black and white, kind of you over there, me over there and the, and the lack of, um, the lack of sort of use of that gray, sort of the complexity of how we all you know, kind of live in the world and, and, and maybe even to kind of have a little further discussion about how really, uh, how it all goes back to this very sort of human and emotional uh, kind of uh, basic thing, you know, that I won't listen to you if I feel like you're rolling your eyes or, you know, I won't listen to you if I feel like you're not listening to me and how basic and emotional that is and that everything, of course, on top of that is really valid, but as a filmmaker, I feel like m my job is to figure out how people tick so I can create them. And I'm always interested in the things that kind of make up a character. And I feel like it's always so emotional, no matter what's on top of it, no matter what sort of the basic kind of intellectual, you know, kind of exterior is, there's at the center of it, there's something very emotional. And I think even more so for the average person that's really kind of struggling to figure out all of these very, uh, you know, sometimes kind of sophisticated issues and, and, uh, how to wrap their brains around it, so. No. I was just gonna add in one more um, comment in the hopes that I'll get voted off, but one, <laughs> in a day of talking about civility, we've talked about um, different entities or parties who might have something to say about this and how we might uh, inform our youth, right? So we talked about the government having a responsibility, we talked about the media, we've talked about schools, talked about public media, um, but no time in the day have we talked about parents, actually. It just occurred to me as I was listening, what is the sort of ordinary person response? And I do actually think that, that much of this conversation is about things that also happen in our home and how we uh, relate to our children and, and what we teach them. And the, the word about listening was the perfect the key word for me of that, which is are we teaching our kids to be good, active listeners? Um, does that maybe uh, hold, in some ways, part of the key? Okay. As, as I'm, I think I'm almost on my way out, um, I just wanted to bring up one thing about civil discussion was during the, um, the um, debates, the elections with um, um, Obama and uh, McCain, I remember this one thing that I found very interesting was when um, McCain was holding a speech and a woman breaks in saying, I don't trust him, he's an Arab. And M McCain responded by saying, no, he's not an Arab. He's a decent person. Hmm. And it was, he was trying to say something positive, but in a way, he, he completely hit the other direction. So Arabs are not decent. I found that very interesting. I, I must at least say, I think you got the inflection wrong. He, he did make the statement, but not with that inflection. I think it was perfectly clear what he was saying in the context, that uh, Senator Obama is a decent man, not as opposed to being an Arab, but just a decent man. Sounded like. uh, <laughs> and there's text and there's in interpretation. Group, uh, yeah. In our group earlier, that that example came up as as the kind of um, example that that was very notable to people at the time uh, as a positive instance of, of civility in this on Senator McCain's part, uh, and one that maybe the media and the others uh, could do more to celebrate. Um, it was notable that it happened. Um, it should, it's, it's notable to be remembered I mean, in terms of the ways in which the media might do more uh, to make our discussions civil 
is, is to note those instances as an example where it seems to be working. Okay. What, uh, what brought you up here? Who are you? Uh, my name is Stephanie Malone, and I head up uh, community engagement and education at the PBS station in Seattle. And do, do you notice that the public media folks are volunteering for this, and you, you <laughs> folks who might hate the public media are sitting quietly up in the rafters? Okay, all right, just point of information, not a biased fact. One of the things that I try and do in my work is to bridge conversations and to create opportunities for dialogue around different issues of interest in our community. Um, so this has been uh, a great day, and one of the things I've been thinking of is what's the barrier to civil dialogue? And, uh, and I think I'm going to frame my comment in the form of a question, because I don't have the answer, but it's something that I'm struggling with that I hope some of you might weigh in on. And that is uh, corporate personhood. And I think of the Supreme Court's ruling, which gave corporations some individual rights in terms of uh, being able to contribute to uh, political campaigns and the amount of money that's infused into political campaigns, and especially now the endless campaigning that um, Ann Gutman uh, referred to today and how that chips away at the governing process. I just, I, I wonder what that does to limit our civil dialogue, uh, or if it doesn't. But that's something that's been on my brain today. Okay. Uh, go ahead. You, I'm sorry, you were moving the mic. That's a usual signal for me for somebody to <laughs> jump in. Well, it's not that I'm without ideas. No, no, no. <laughs> I didn't think that. I, I would say this, since you're talking about the media, I'm among that minority who did not hold the media responsible in your instant click question. And uh, I can illustrate why I make that decision at the same time as indicating I think the media can do more. Uh, the media likes what I would refer to as the tight shot. That's why you often see the outrageous or exaggerated without a lot of context. If it were to pan more, not just in space but in time, I think the outrage would diminish because you would see things in context. One example, when uh, the congressman from South Carolina, as I believe it was, shouted, you lie. There was a tight shot on that shout. Had it been a pan in time, and had it caught the statement in the president's address just immediately before, who described his opponents as lying, it would have looked less outrageous and egregious than it did. But there was no panning. So that's a simple technique that could have made it less troublesome than it otherwise appeared to be. Okay. Well, I mean, you know, th this this emphasis on context that you're that you're getting to, I think. Um, not necessarily uh, to disparage any of my previous employers, but the, the news hour has been one of the few places that I've had an opportunity to say, we can talk about matters that matter, we can frame conversations with people who disagree agreeably, and we can give it a heck of a lot more time, perhaps not even enough time, but a lot more time, and we can try to play you the entire soundbite, or we have the extra minute and a half, which most network television shows don't have. Um, we're going to take a, uh, we're going to do another one of these uh, quick uh, Q&As, so get your clickers out, and then we're going to go into round three. You're going to see the, uh, the fuzzy people walk by here in a second. So uh, th the question number three here is yes or no, is it okay for political debate to be intense and combative? One is yes, two is no. The question again is, is it okay for political debate to be intense and combative? One is yes. Two is no, and with that, we'll start uh, round three, which means that we have audience questions from not just the internet, but other folks that have been in the museum, and we've got these little cards. And so, again, the, the, the rule still applies. If you want to help one of these folks get off the chair right now, you're going to have to come up and save them. And I think that, you know, they're doing great so far. So, um, let's see here. This, this question here, do you believe our political leaders actually want a dis I mean, yeah. Very classy. Um, that's, that's just, yeah, exactly. Because you know the scantily clad folks wouldn't have gotten your attention at all. <laughs> You're far above that, aren't you? So uh, do you believe our political leaders actually want a discussion away from the glare of the media nowadays? Sandra says this from New Braunfels, Texas. Anyone? Anyone? Do you believe our political leaders actually want a discussion away from the glare of the media nowadays? I, th I, I think they probably should. I, 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 I mean, there's, 
I'm just thinking in, in my own experience in the university, there, there are lots of things that are, would be more difficult if they were more visible, more, more public. Some of them have to be private, confidential. Um, there are even laws that require that, as particularly when you're talking uh, with and about students. Um, uh, surely, in politics, there, even if you look at the Freedom of Information Act, um, there's, it's a wonderful instrument um, uh, for making public information public, uh, and it's supposed to make more public information public, but uh, it also has nine exemptions, that one of which is to protect government, to protect discussion inside government, uh, what they sometimes call pre-decisional deliberation, a rather weird term, but an interesting one that says um, sometimes a committee will gather and, uh, and people want to send out a, uh, uh, just try something out, uh, brainstorm. Um, uh, and not be held responsible for their statements. Um, that is protected from, uh, from FOIA requests. And it seems to me it should be. I'm sure if I were in the government, I would, I would think there should be even more of such inst instances. I mean, is that even possible today? I mean, in this era where really our thoughts are amplified so quickly, I mean, obviously, if you want to go out and publish a blog, go right ahead. But, uh, you know, who says what about the the, the conversation that is happening on this stage right now is so far beyond our control. Um, and how will that be trended up through Google News? Or, you know, you've worked your entire life to be a professor of journalism at Columbia University, and perhaps what you say on this panel today ends up becoming the most relevant page rank associated with your name. I know, I know, because you've said some Here's incendiary hoping, right? things so far. I, I have, and why isn't someone replacing me? Here? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. I think I agree mostly with my colleague from Columbia. Um, I do think that the recent efforts by the Obama administration and the Sunlight uh, Foundation and others to try to unearth more data, for instance, in uh, government is very important. In the same token, I do think that having open and closed spaces for deliberation is important. And to the question, I believe that lawmakers do want to have those closed spaces for those conversations. I think that in um, academia, we talk a lot about this um, public-private divide and it's a very interesting topic right now, which is, um, is there a blurring between the public and the private, particularly in these online environments? And I think there's sort of a default um, switch. Uh, the, it's now that uh, information about us is public by default, and it's really private through great effort. And actually, I, I worry some that the, um, the being able to keep information about ourselves in a private uh, way um, is in fact becoming a luxury and an elite thing as opposed to something that um, uh, that we all have some access to. So I, I think that we should see the public conversation uh, and the debate about it as r related to the, uh, the way in which our own uh, personal information is treated as well. His pleas spoke to you. Yes, you the, the, Tell the us who you are. concomitant emotion to shame is pity, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm Richard Kilberg, and I'm the president of the Fred Friendly Seminars at Columbia University. So really, it was an alumni thing. You had to kind of come in there. And a colleague, alma yeah. Mater. Right, 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 a colleague. So uh, what, what, your first thoughts? Ah, well, my first thoughts. Um, uh, you know, I, I think uh, there are, is a lot of dialogue we don't, we're not privy to. Obviously, the politicians do the people's business, and the people's business, one has to know one's own business. And I think they understand that, but you know, deals get struck all the time. I, I, I don't think, uh, obviously a politician has two functions. One is to uh, uh, do legislation and the other is to get elected. And I think they can pretty much set those. Uh, I, I don't think there's much of a question. They, they know how to set those in different spheres and, uh, and have conversations at, in different kinds of, uh, degrees of publicness. Okay. May I say just one word about sure. that? Uh, we, of course, live in the era of the open mic, and very many people have been <laughs> caught by it. So that the problem, it seems to me, is not whether leaders wish to deliberate privately, but whether they have the self-command to avoid exposing themselves accidentally. 
uh, that they can and do deliberate privately, we know if we simply remind ourselves of the, simple, of the question, how was the Affordable Health Care Act written? We know how the debate was postured, but do we know how it was written? No, most of that was done very privately. They still can and do. Well, we've got some results for your answers to question three. Uh, is it okay for political debate to be intense and combative? In the room, 86% said yes, and online, 100% said yes. <laughs> Go figure. Not like the, the online world uh, appreciates a good fight. Um, we wouldn't want to make that leap. Okay, so and then, uh, let's go ahead and ask uh, a, a fourth question here. Get your remote controls out. It's a yes or no question. Should we hold ourselves to the same standards of civility that we hold our elected officials? One is a yes and two is a no. Again, the question is, should we hold ourselves to the same standards of civility that we hold our elected officials? And that actually dovetails nicely into uh, one of the questions here. Uh, how can we attract the best statesmen and stateswomen of the future uh, since the present election politics are so divisive? Does the process repeal, repel the best people? Would a multi-party, okay, I think that's the best part. <laughs> Is, I mean, I really can't read the rest, so. Well, I think we do hold ourselves to a higher standard of civility than we hold politicians. Part of the uh, disease uh, about incivility is that one d feels it's false. Uh, and it's almost always committed for a public audience. Uh, the face-to-face -face, uh, interactions between people, personal interactions, uh, interactions with people you have to live with on a day-to-day -day basis, they're always almost more civil. Almost always more civil. Not always, but almost always. So much it's, there's so much at stake, right? right? I mean, there's, and the consequences are bigger. I think that's a big part of it. I mean, if you're really unpleasant to someone, you have to either own up to it or defend it or in, you know, very, very real ways. Whereas I think that um, everything else feels so far away. Um, I would say that the issue is not civility in Sunday school, with all due respect. That the issue is how do we deal with uh, fellow citizens who are therefore civic friends when we encounter them and encounter difference at the same time. At that moment, I would say it is still important to hold those in positions of leadership to a higher standard even than we hold the ordinary citizen. Though we would certainly hope that the ordinary citizen would be inspired by the model of those in office and those who present leadership. But it's the necessity that those who have to present the leadership do the modeling is far more important than anything else, it seems to me. And I think part of the answer goes back to that private-public conversation, too. When I talk to young people in interviews about whether or not they're going to go into politics and civic life, they're worried a fair amount about the tracks they're leaving behind and whether or not they're going to be held to a different standard because they've had so much of their lives recorded and it's very hard to forget or delete things that you did, for instance, in high school when you're running for office. Yeah, I, I can't uh, wait for the day when somebody is sort of baby birthing video shows up in a campaign ad, you know, really going that far back and knowing the candidate uh, because it was on YouTube. Um, a question here kind of dubbed, how can we get the messages that we're talking about today to a wider audience? So this is kind of a, a responsibility check on the people that are in the room. What, 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 are, what are at least the folks that are up here capable of doing? And then really, if the rest of you want to chime in, get on stage, hint, hint. You, you can I'm, I'm actually planning on replicating a very similar local model in Seattle uh, uh, around this discussion of civility and democracy. And, and um, most of the people uh, that have been participating today have, um, uh, have the ability to do something similar, if it's with a humanities commission, if it's at a university. Uh, but to continue to keep that discussion alive, that's, uh, that's an important next step. Obviously not on the same level, but you know a smaller localized version and and people will step up because I think that this is something uh, a conversation that um, the public recognizes needs to happen um, especially uh, uh, Yeah, I just uh, I was thinking after the the incident in Arizona and and a lot of uh, uh, from our president to uh, to members of Congress to just uh, your average uh, 
person, uh, everybody was talking about the need to be more civil and, and have civil dialogue, so. You're gonna make a movie about this? Uh, uh, no, but I, but I do, I do think that, um, I do actually think that sort of the idea of what we consume matters so much um, and, and that um, maybe the responsibility on the end of just the ordinary person is um, kind of consuming better um, and, and that, um, that I feel like, so my responsibility would be to, you know, to find a way, for instance, to make films that are relevant to people who are working class and working poor. You know, like that, I feel like that's sort of the thing that I'm interested in. And I, I think that, uh, you know, I think there's something in a way, like I, I don't know, I was talking to someone about watching All in the Family uh, recently, which I haven't seen since maybe I was 14. And regardless of kind of whatever you think about that show, I was struck in a way by how it had all these elements of things that we have today, but it also had this element of politics. And I thought that it was interesting in a way that they wove the sort of political uh, conversation into something that felt very ordinary and palatable and very familiar. And I think that, um, I don't know, I feel like the media has a, a great ability to either in a very direct way or in a very sly way or in a very sophisticated way, but to reach the ordinary person uh, in not a way that alienates, but a way that sort of pe people can find uh, a way into a subject. Uh, so instead of it uh, perhaps being a conversation that's sort of, you know, about sort of complicated um, threads about history, like how do you kind of pull people into a conversation that, that in a way that they can participate? Um, so I think that to me that's always the challenge, you know, in how I use media, how I consume it as just an ordinary person, but how as a filmmaker I can tell stories perhaps that can, you know, connect to somebody on the level that of what their life is and at the same time put a thread in that speaks of something bigger, so. What are you going to do? Yeah, you. <laughs> what am I going to do to spread the word? Yes. Um, I, I don't actually contemplate doing anything specifically. There's so much of what we've discussed that is the warp and woof of my entire career in life. I don't, haven't discovered a need to alter my practices or my expectations. You just came down, you joined us. Was it the shame? Sort of. <laughs> um, I Who use a you? forum, like, my name is Karen Izzo, I teach eighth grade. <laughs> and I have to say my 13 year olds are way more interested in getting into the forum than everyone in here seems to be, including myself. Um, Thank you for piling it on. Yeah, they seem, well my students are, you know, chomping at the bit to knock somebody out. Um, <laughs> we, were, we were sort of told who we had to pick out. Um, I think I think it's important to to for for myself anyway. I think as a teacher, someone was talking earlier about um, the lack of of conversation in the classroom about controversial issues, and students really really want to talk about controversial issues. I know my students do, and I know part of the reason it's it's difficult is because the teachers find it really difficult to talk about controversial issues with students. Um, but I'm encouraged for the future in terms of civility and, and democracy and, and dialogue and discussion. I know last year there were some very contentious budget debates in the town where I teach and I was encouraged to see a number of students from the high school level, particularly since they were going to be voting that year, coming out and, and talking very eloquently about how um, some of the things that, you know, some of the budgetary issues were going to be affecting them and they they were very civil and and very impassioned at the same time so i think more conversations are important i mean in the fred friendly conversations i mean you actually made a great not business but these were actually the wedged it's, issues it's not a great business no <laughs> you made a horrible business but you made a, a phenomenal program uh, uh, that the controversies actually offered you the opportunity those wedge issues that were on everybody's minds that were the sort of hot potato issues that was actually the most fascinating stuff you got people you figured out a way to get people to disagree beyond agreeably but really just to get them around the table how, how does it work um, well first of all we say that uh, these programs are about the contention of legitimate differences. So, uh, so that um, we're automatically talking about things which, you know, honest and respectable people can agree to disagree about. 
Um, you know, one of the things, one of the notable failures of uh, over the years was an attempt to to have a dialogue in Israel about the Israeli-Palestinian uh, issues because there was no ground for conversation. Um, I don't think that's where we're at here in this country, anywhere near where we're at. Um, but, um, but you know, I, I, I have a, uh, we did uh, several years ago, a couple of years ago, we did a series on ethics, specific areas of ethics, and um, one was on ethics in health, end of life issues, and one was ethics in the judiciary, and um, uh, Barney Frank was on each of them, uh, Representative Frank, and uh, on the one about end-of-life issues, a woman from the Family Resources Council, which is a conservative Christian organization, and I walked back after the taping with her, and she was stupefied um, and concerned, I think, about her own moral health because she said, I, I can't believe it, I agreed with Barney Frank. Um, and uh, later, uh, when we did the thing on judiciary, Barney, it was Barney's turn walking out saying, oh, I, I agree with Justice Scalia, I can't believe it. Um, I don't think the, uh, I, and I consider that um, an incredible achievement on our part to get that kind of response from, from those people. Um, but on the other hand, I don't think it changed their public dialogue at all. I think on the other, uh, I do think that it may well have created personal bridges so that there could be conversations, again, say, shall we say private conversations or private understandings in which um, they, could, they realized that um, neither side was the devil, that they both had the, uh, the, um, the, uh, the welfare of the commonweal in mind when they were doing what they were doing, that they could respect their differences, have a conversation, and walk away still disagreeing. But I don't think that it's going to change anybody's soundbite. Sir. Yep. Hello. Uh, I'm uh, Ralph Young, and I'm a history professor at Temple University. And um, I just wanted to share uh, an experience I've had at Temple, which I think is you know, some cause for hope in all of this. Um, I um, uh, teach a course on descent in America, and the first time I was teaching the course, um, students just kept sticking around after class was over and wanting to continue the conversation. Uh, one day, I was, uh, we were talking about Margaret Fuller, the 19th century feminist who had said that in every man is the feminine principle and in every woman is the masculine principle. And I asked the students, well, what do you think of this? And everybody went around the table and made some comments. And at one point I looked at my watch and realized that the class had actually ended 10 minutes earlier. It was already 1.40 and the class was supposed to be at 1.30 and nobody had packed up and they were just so engaged in this. And then this, and I, I just said, well, I'm sorry, but uh, you know, if anybody, if you want to stay, we'll keep staying until somebody kicks us out of the room. And they all stayed for the next hour. And this just kicked it off. It went on, you know, every Monday, Wednesday, Friday after class, they stuck around for this conversation in which we were trying to uh, look at the historical background of contemporary issues that affected them in their lives. And one day I suggested, well, why don't we just open up um, our Friday post-class discussion and invite other students, and we'll call it a teach-in. You know, I'm from the 60s, what can I say? You know? <laughs> and um, so they uh, really liked the idea. One student volunteered that they wanted to do a, a, a teach-in on the Patriot Act, which had just been passed at the time. Another student said he wanted to do a teach-in on the Iraq War resolution and comparing it with the Vietnam War resolution. And this just took off. It was like a real phenomenon. This was in the, in the fall semester of 2002. And as the semester drew to an end, students uh, were just so into this kind of dialogue that we were having, and it was very respectful. People were, they had very you know, different views from each other, and yet, 
everybody was listening to each other and respecting that. And just before the end of the semester, the students voted unanimously, well, let's continue these, let's keep this going in the next semester. And sure enough, they, they, people showed up and it's got to be the point where we, we had between 40 to 100 people showing up on a Friday afternoon between three and five. You know, and these are 18, 19, 20 year old students who normally would much rather be out at happy hour even though it's illegal. And uh, they, they're sitting around and really engaged in these conversations. And uh, anyway, to make a long story short, which is already a long story, uh, these are still going on. This is nine years now. And every Friday afternoon, we've been having discussions. I've had students who had graduated, gone off and served a, a tour of duty in Iraq and come back and let a teach in about their experiences in Iraq. And I've had people who have gone out on protests coming back and talking about that. So we've had like the whole spectrum. And for me, this is, uh, I, I think that a lot of young people today especially have a real thirst for understanding our history and for making their you know, experiences in today's world more meaningful for them. And those students would get up on this stage. I'm just saying, <laughs> just letting you know. Uh, that's, that's actually pretty fascinating, and you should actually figure out a way to, to try to live stream that on the internet, or, you know, that, that'd be pretty interesting. That we uh, we actually have just started doing that this that's semester. Great. We're doing that. Actually, one of, one of the students who used to go to these teach-ins was uh, one of the people who work here at the Constitution Center. Okay, shameless plug, <laughs> totally included. Right, All right. Uh, a com let's see, some questions here. I've got <laughs> clearly directed at me. Is shame civil? Are civil, pe are civil people the only ones that respond to shame? Monica C. from Philadelphia. Yes, I think so. Um, and I think we do have an answer for number four. Um, should we hold ourselves to the same standards of civility that we hold our elected officials? One was yes and two was no. And it was 80%, in which direction was it? 80% yes that we should hold ourselves to the same standards of civility that we hold and 100% online, so 80% of the folks in the audience. So really, the other 20% of you, this is what fascinate me. But uh, and then we'll finally have our last question on, on the, the remote control things here, so get them out again. Uh, has our conversation been civil thus far? Yes or no? One yes, two no, come on. I mean, nobody's really been throwing any bombs here, so. But I'm just gonna predict that, but go ahead. Maybe, maybe it hasn't been civil to you, so please go ahead and vote. Um, There was kind of a, converse, a, a, a question that came up a little bit in the, as, as an offshoot of the, perhaps the conversations in the morning. Who gets to define political terms? Socialist, fascist, patriot, et cetera. The media, politicians, citizens, and how does this impact civility? Aren't you glad you just stepped up? Man. <laughs> so yeah, why don't you actually introduce yourself, tell us, and you can buy these guys some time. So what made you come up here? And then uh, what would you be profound, because she's helping you out. Okay. My name's Ann Fisher, and I have a talk show at WOSU um, Public Media in Columbus, Ohio. Public media again, OK? Do we see a pattern here? Educators and public media people are not afraid to stand up there, share their wisdom for free or low cost. Let's just say. <laughs> There's a lot of reasons. I kept going like this, <clears throat> and then I would stop because someone would start talking, and it would be interesting, and I wouldn't want to interrupt them. One thing, the teacher that was in our group, yeah, he was up earlier. Um, one of the things that he mentioned that he did uh, that I thought was more important than anything was when he brings his classes together, the first thing he does is have the class together decide on the rules of the class on the order of the class. And I think that exercises something in these kids' brains that they don't get an opportunity to exercise very often. And I think it's the same thing with your conversations with your students after your class. Uh, and I think it's, uh, it's, I think it's literally, you know, there's that whole idea of brain elasticity. Now, I think it is literally something that is a muscle in their brain. They're getting to exercise, and it's the most valuable thing you can do is teach them to self-govern. Uh, teach them to make these decisions on their own. And everything about schools today, uh, all you know, present company excluded, um, seems to be about coming in, uh, 
you know, accumulating some kind of knowledge and facts and figures and then regurgitating it at some point, and I'm generalizing, of course, but this is particularly true in, not in college necessarily, but in grade school, high school, that sort of thing. So the more we can help them exercise these uh, parts of their brain, making decisions, joining in a conversation extemporaneously, not being uh, required to answer a question on a test and do it that way, um, and participate and, and make up the rules of their own class, that's what they want to do. I think that's what they're thirsting to do. And I, I would love to have one of your students up here, frankly. Uh, I moderated a panel discussion a few weeks ago about a study that was done on adolescent girls, and they weren't on the panel. None of them were on the panel. There were some of them out in the audience, and I really wanted to know what they thought and what they, you know, how they would like to see uh, programs developed around uh, nurturing them and that sort of thing. So that's what I wanted to talk about. Semantics, I can do that too. Okay. Go ahead. Well, another thing about the, you know, the, uh, going off on that is that uh, as teachers, as educators, you know, we ha do have a responsibility to bring out of the students, you know, instead of just putting something into them. And uh, like, for example, during these teach-ins, I always try to encourage uh, if somebody asks a question, not to have whoever's leading the teacher necessarily answer it, but to ask within the group, well, you know, does anybody want to respond to that? And get a dialogue going rather than a, just a Q&A kind of thing. And I think that's, you know, very important to do that. Uh, a, a thing on, on just the, the definition idea, and I don't know if this is actually directly responding to that question, but we have to remember that Civility and civil disobedience are two different things here. And, you know, civility in a sense, I think, I think you know, the way I've been looking at this uh, is can we get our politicians, can we get people that are talking on the political dialogue to uh, be more respectful of each other and still disagree in all this. But civil disobedience is for people who are disempowered trying to become empowered. Uh, this argument about civility between, say, Republicans and Democrats, well, they're all the power structure. They're empowered. Uh, this is not a question that, you know, maybe they're trying to hold more power over each other, but they're not, uh, you know, they all have that seat at the table, as we say, and the people who are, whether it's Martin Luther King uh, or, uh, you know, any of the people that have, you know, staged protests who don't have a seat at that table, who want to be part of the power structure, you know, that's when, you know, you know, more things are acceptable in that regard. Semantics? Uh, <laughs> don't have an opinion. <laughs> well, you know, in our public dialogue, uh, words, uh, if, if to address the question, words um, have begun to assume implications that that absent that public dialogue, they ne wouldn't necessarily have. Uh, if uh, in France, if you're in a dialogue and someone is a socialist, why, that's a political party. That's all it is. Uh, in America, uh, a socialist is um, a political slur. It doesn't have to be intended that way, but most people will hear it that way because of the history of our language, not because of the intention of the speaker. Um, so I think um, who has the right to define it? You know, these things are organic and they, they evolve over time. No one really has the right to define anything. But I think If the legislation is called the Affordable Care Act and if it's called Obamacare by, is that an interpretation or should we just call it Well, they're the both an interpretations, right? And no one, uh, you know, I haven't heard it much called the Affordable Care Act. But I, I actually uh, uh, thought the question was towards some of the dialogue this morning that I was trying to address. Um, yeah, well, that's obviously a fight, right? Uh, that's part of the evolution of how this is, uh, this is playing out. And there's no uh, wrong or right. You know, frankly, uh, personally, I don't even though I know Obamacare is often used as, uh, uh, almost intended as a slur, I frankly, personally, <laughs> just think of it, well, it's Obamacare, fine, you know. It's almost become like what Kleenex is to tissue. Right, it's you know. Just, it's just kind of lost <laughs> it's, its punch. 
One thing um, that I think uh, John Stewart does on The Daily Show very, very well is take what the media has done with all the different little um, uh, one-liners they impose or uh, apply to different situations and how it just kind of spins almost out of control the use of these uh, phrases. And I, I can't think of any right now, of course, but he does a kind of a regular uh, deal on that. Show all the media expanding all different um, points of view um, almost come out saying the exact same thing over and over and over again. The most trusted man in news on Comedy Central. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say it. I think that was <laughs> guy with true. the bow tie. Uh, okay, we've got probably seven or eight minutes or less, so if you're on the bubble, this is, I feel like this is a pledge drive. Please call now, <laughs> please give. It isn't, but it's just to try to get you out of your seats and get down here. I know that you had a lot of conversations, oh, maybe you just all talked out, but um, if, if we've just got a few minutes, so if you want to do that, go ahead. You were about to say something? Uh, no. Oh, <laughs> all right. So, um, and, and remember that this is archived forever, so <laughs> no pressure. I mean, this could be your, your five minutes. There we go, we've got one guy coming down. Um, you know, when, we're, when we've been talking earlier today, I kind of see a couple of these sort of consistent threads of, one, that it's, that, that, that it's not just a bifurcation, that there are these nuances, that there are these gray areas, that people need to be respected, that we need to create a venue, uh, that people need to listen, et cetera, and that, uh, that and, and as Professor Young said, that there is hope that there are people that still take this seriously. Um, why are you here? Uh, well, I finally I, convinced you? Yeah. <laughs> well, I gave up. Uh, so I'm Alan Brinkley. I'm a uh, historian at Columbia. There's a lot of Columbians up here today. Uh, I just wanted to get back to the uh, issue of, of civility, which was the core of this, of this meeting. And, um, and I believe in civility, too, of course. Uh, but I think there are also things that are more important than civility sometimes. And I think we, we've been talking this morning about the Founding Fathers. One of our Founding Fathers was Thomas Paine. Uh, I wouldn't call him a particularly civil person, uh, but a very important person in the history of the United States. Uh, William Lloyd Garrison, uh, one of the most hated men in America, uh, who launched the abolitionist movement. Um, you know, I could go on. Uh, the, civility, I think, is uh, very important in the governmental process, although even there, not always. Uh, but there are things, there are values that are more important than civility. Um, and, uh, and I think it, sometimes that gets lost in conversations about civility in which uh, that seems to be the only thing that we should care about. So I just thought that was something we should uh, think about when we, as we come to the end of this uh, event. See, he used that wisely. He wanted to get his point across, he came in at the end. <laughs> so, uh, uh, what do you think? Uh, I agree. I also think, you know, it's a mistake to, uh, to confuse civility with dissent. Um, you know, among the readings we had were, was the Martin Luther King letter from the Birmingham jail, which um, uh, was unbelievably civil and deeply dissenting uh, of the criticism he was receiving. Uh, you know, dissent is essential. Um, it's a question of how, how it's expressed. Uh, so it's a big difference. I just wanted to do a quick in defense of the media because I'm not always sure what people are saying when they say the media. But if nothing else, in the last 25 years, it is absolutely startling and amazing and and incredibly wonderful the diversity of media we have. We've never had it better when it comes to that. And that if we're, if we're only looking at stuff and listening to stuff that we agree with, then shame on us. Um, there's no excuse for it. It's never been easier. There's never, there's never been more access. You can go to your local library if it's a technological uh, shortcoming. There is absolutely no reason. And so you can lead a horse to water. You know, there's that argument. You can't, if, if, if it's all out there. It's not the media, it's the consumers of the media um, it's, it, it, because there's no shortage of diversity. You know, uh, the most uh, rewarding part of this event for me was the discussion we had this afternoon 
And the most, uh, what made that rich was the diversity of voices there and, and the way they contended with each other and revealed, uh, it was revealing to me um, the points of view from which they were, people were coming from uh, and seeing the same, same situation with very different eyes. Um, I think that experience alone is uh, uh, an enriching one. It does require us to get out of our little cell um, and make an effort. Um, or even, I don't know what else to say about it, but um, you know, uh, that's what, what's, um, what makes incivility more easily, uh, more easy to happen is when you no longer know the other person, when you don't feel it's a person, it's some abstract view that you've demonized for some reason. Um, but uh, uh, having opportunities like this, uh, whether it's here in Philadelphia for a national audience or in your local community or your family, um, you know, that's, that's where this thing is gonna be uh, fought out and that's where you'll find some changes. Um, I think the, I have the answer to the last question. Has our conversation been civil thus far? Yes or no? One was a yes, two was a no. What was it? It was 100% which direction? Yeah, right. <laughs> okay. Uh, and, and with that, I, I'd really like to thank all of you, the National Constitution Center, obviously, for having us, hosting us. Uh, I, I've never done this sort of survivor thing before, and thanks for bearing with me and, and the torture that I imposed on you. Um, and, and also thanks to the online audience for submitting questions. And again, all of this is archived online, all of the breakout sessions, which I thought were fascinating, and I actually wish that I could have gone to all five of them all at once, but I think you'll find value whether you're in this room or out of this room. So thank you all for coming, and again, uh, thanks to the National Constitution Center for such a great day.